I'd like to introduce Vladimir, who's going to be discussing writing side channels for processor so software. Sorry, I screwed that up. Writing POCs for processor so software side channels, uh, which you know, leading off the uh, the previous talk around zombie load seems like uh, good planning. All right, thanks. All right, uh, hi everyone. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm a security researcher slash hardware hacker. Uh, well, it wasn't like that for past five years, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, past four years I was doing basically started doing uh, hardware and, and so on. So I built up the lab, and then like this year I got the SCM to do more more hardware actual research instead of doing some software that they started off with. Um, so how did it start? You know, like I got interested into, uh, well, when I heard about the vulnerability, I say L1TF, uh, which stands for L, uh, level, one, uh, um, level one cache uh, terminal fault. And the researchers, like, so the previous uh, speaker talked about uh, their independent research that they did. They found uh, vulnerabilities based on that. Um, so when this vulnerability came out, I started to think, look at it, and then uh, got really interested because L leaking, leaking L1 cache is a really powerful thing, uh, as it was demonstrated before. Because, um, well, not just that, but also uh, Intel really relies on level one cache to do things like loading a ACM modules, for example, and like other things. So they they can mark cache as a RAM, for example, right, and do 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 all other things. Um, so I wanted to create the, make a POC for this to 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 make a reproduction since there was there was no POCs online yet when the vulnerability came out. Um, so when we have uh, memory accesses, I haven't made that diagram, you know, uh, very simplified. Um, we have, you know, virtual address. Uh, you get a page fault. Page, page fault. Uh, process, when the processor receives the page fault, uh, it looks up the page table, does the page walk. Uh, it looks up the physical address in the PTE. Uh, if, if you're running in a hypervisor, then that, that address takes... Uh, is taking and then uh, look, is looked up in the APT, which is extended page tables. So that's how hypervisor enforces uh, enforces the memory mapping. Uh, then that that address is uh, converted into the physical address, and then physical address is used to uh, address the information in the caches. So like a L1 cache, so L1 data cache. You know, and then you get your your information. Uh, well, so what, what the researchers found, uh, actually, um, uh, when the fault happens, um, for example, when you, like, set, uh, you know, you, you, you initialize the PTEs in the wrong way, or you're trying to access invalid memory, uh, the speculative, speculative execution engine uh, keeps executing instructions in the background, because there is this synchronization issue, the signal did not, uh, didn't get received in time. So you have a couple of cycles uh, that when it starts executing. So it, it keeps executing for a couple more cycles until signal is actually delivered, uh, no, the default is delivered. Uh, so and as we know from uh, previous research of a, of a meltdown, uh, the speculative, speculative execution engine does not actually check anything. It's basically YOLO. You just take the, the, the instructions and it, so it has only a very limited set of instructions that can execute. So if it reaches the instruction that it doesn't know, like some high privileged or very complicated instruction, it will, not, it will stop executing. But simple instructions like move, add, and other operations, it, it can execute, but it does not perform any checks. Like this is as a typical uh, as a typical execution engine. Uh, so what happens is the fault ch fault happens. Uh, the executing engine takes the page frame number from the PTE and treats it as a physical address directly without checking anything. And then and and then from then then on you go and look up in the L1 cache 
And if you have that information, now you can use it. And from what previous talk was all talking about, you can leak the information, right? Same, same happens with uh, EPTs, right? Which is even worse. Like, well, so, which is even worse because uh, when the translation happens, the, the, it's supposed to check the EPTs and, 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 and that physical address, well, it, it, since it's not gonna match, it, you know, you're not gonna be able to uh, get the information you need and you get the, the execution gonna stop, right? But since you're getting directly the physical address, you know, it's treated being as a phys direct physical address, you basically can, can, can read any memory uh, without, um, can, can read any memory uh, as long as it's in the cache, right? So uh, you can read either in SMM and or VMM or any other mode that, as long as it's in the cache, right? Um, so I've been uh, writing POCs. I did actually uh, work for Big Blue, but I did not know about Dell 1TF because I already left them. Uh, and, and so I've been writing POCs for quite a while. Um, and so this is, I made the list, like what do you kind of want to pay attention to? Like if you're trying to make a reproduction proof of, proof of concept, you like either could use the, uh, <laughs> either could use uh, uh, already available POCs like on GitHub or not, or start, start your own, right? So, so like first thing is your code gonna be messy, like, you're gonna be experimenting with lots of things. You want to use like some source code uh, version control, right? Uh, you're gonna get bugs and like just stupid mistakes. Uh, so you, yeah, just, just be patient, um, right? And so the th third one is really important. Uh, when you think that, oh, you, uh, you found something interesting, you want to really test it against false positives or false negatives. You wanna make sure you have a consistent, consistent behavior um, uh, so let's say you found something and then like, oh, it's leaking some information. Well, it does that information really make any sense, right? So you want to look for patterns like, you know, typically, so the uh, cache organized in the cache lines, which is a size of 64 bytes, for example, right? Or it can be like a RSB, like a return stack buffer, which is 16, or any other like internal structure uh, uh, typically that, that is not necessary, but typically is in, in the power of two, right? Um, so like typical bug, you can might have like, a, okay, you're getting, you're, getting, you're getting some results, but like it's like spitting out like infinite, infinite amount of like just random bytes that, 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 that doesn't make any sense, you know? Um, um, yeah, you wanna look up the CPU structures, like, okay, you see some, you see the leaks, but, um, that information not necessary is like power of two, or you don't you, you don't see any familiar patterns, right? You want to like depends on the way, what kind of you're going going after. You want to make sure that you check the uh, the manual, right? Um, so if if you have a if you have a CPU that supports TCX, the transactional memory extensions, uh, you want to use that. So that so what does what TCX does is it su suppresses faults. So even if you do the, uh, if, if, if in, I mean, you access some invalid memory, it will not actually raise an exception. CPU, CPU internally are gonna suppress it and, and let you know. So you can do that programmatically without, without actually raising, uh, raising the exception. That will make sure that your example cache or any other uh, structures not getting polluted by other, other threads. Uh, yeah, so if you, let's say, got some results, you, you might want to do some visualization and graphing to get some kind of outliers uh, or um, like averaging of your results and so on. Uh, run multiple iterations for, for your tests. Like, you, it's not gonna work just on a single run. You want to like run it multiple, you know, thousands, 100,000 times to get better results. Um, and use like a CPOID instruction to flush the pipeline. So uh, as, as we've seen uh, previously, right, like Intel releases the patch, they introduced like, oh, we introduced a new MSR. What actually it does, it invokes the microcode. 
right? And which is really expensive. So CPU ID is going to do the same thing. It's going to actually flash the instruction, but CPU ID is you can call from user mode. So you don't have to worry about you running, for example, making development in, in the kernel of the kernel module. Right, so, uh, so as I started to look at the information that Intel provided for this, uh, I noticed that, well, they claim that the L1TF can be triggered only when the uh, present bit is uh, not set or some reserved bits are, are set. Uh, well, so like just, just thinking about it, well, if I access, access invalid memory, for example, right, uh, that, that, that means that the, pre the present bit is not set, right? But what, what, what's that say I, if I do the write to the read-only memory, right? It should also raise the exception, right? So it should raise the page fault. Why did not, they, didn't, they didn't mention that? So I started really curious, like, it's kind of weird. Like, it, if vendor tries to provide the information, they should provide all of the information. I mean, I don't know if it's really, like, I mean, they just didn't see it as a... Uh, attack vector or or whatever you know um, like for, for for example for me attack vector will be really easy uh, you provide the read-only memory to kernel and kernel tries to read from it and then maybe you can pivot uh, or get find a gadget in kernel that will do the load it for you meanwhile you're in the tr other thread uh, uh, trying to monitor that memory um, so you know, as, as I was uh, validating my results, uh, I found that, well, you know, like, if it's in the cache, right, uh, I all get the really fast accesses. But how to make da data not being in the cache? Well, you see all flash. You, you, you flash the cache lines, right? So make it, uh, make it not being there. Uh, I found that, well, I'm, I'm flashing it, and, but I still some see some leaks. So the first... Uh, First numbers is just number of those iterations that I mentioned before. You want to run your attack, you know, as many uh, times as possible. Uh, the, the other one is just like uh, page fold, CPU number four. And for some reason, there was byte is a same byte was leaking, and and the, just information about the clocks, uh, how many clocks did it take, right? Uh, so, so in case of positive, in false positive, I shouldn't have seen some like a fixed number, fixed byte number. Uh, that, that has been leaked, right? Like, it, if it would be just false positive, I would get, like, just random numbers. Like, I don't know why it's zero two for me but in this case, but, I mean, that's how it was. And then I was like, well, okay, this something is not wrong. Like, I mean, something is wrong. Like, how do I, uh, you know, how do I confirm this? Uh, so, so I decided, okay, the seal flash is not working for me, so what do I do? Well, I mean, Marking the memory as uncacheable obviously going to be the solution because that's the only way to uh, to make sure that it, it it's never in in your in your cache because it should not be in the cache otherwise if you have a problem right so and then and actually Intel uh, mentions on the on their website that uh, there's a mitigation you should if you if you if you're able you you can store the uh, some sensitive information in cacheable memory since it's not going to be in the cache right so. Uh, it's like a perfect solution if you want to keep the secrets, right? And then uh, this is from the, their optimization manual saying that, saying, saying that the speculative execution will never um, access a uh, uncacheable memory or ne never going to take a trap or uh, fold or trap. Uh, so I was, as, I, as I was playing with the uh, uncacheable memory, I started to see, uh, well, it's still, it's still leaking the information. And like I used like I just filled the memory with a the, you know EE pattern and like it it would it popped up there which is like it doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, so I was digging through the manual a lot. Uh, like I'm not a hacker. I'm not gonna read 600 pages of like just the optimization manual. It was really frustrating to be honest. I, I found a uh, I found the like a hint on their actually form. Somebody was asking about the uh, buffer, uh, the, these internal buffers, like she actually never heard of, because I'm not the security architect, or uh, not the CPU architect, um, right? Um, so, as it was mentioned before, you know, these, re these buffers sit basically, you know, between the register and the cache, but then if you have uncached memory, where does it go? Cannot go, in, get, cannot go into the registers directly, right? 
because uh, otherwise it would be really, really slow for your uncacheable memory. Uh, so that, that's why, like, you know, they have, they have buffers there, um, you know, and it, it was making perfect sense, and especially because, well, these buffers are, you know, you're, they're really tiny, right? I mean, there, there are not that many of them, so that's why the results are really, really slow. So you saw the video previously, right? The, uh, the attack works, but takes time, right? Um, so finally, I made a uh, proof of concept for what Intel called as the MDS, uh, which is a micro credential data sampling. Um, um, I, I made the proof of concept. The first uh, DICK process uh, uh, puts the secret in, into the uh, memory, uh, and then waits for the attacker to try to read it out. Uh, and they, they, they are on the same, uh, on the same core. So the, the buffers are shared uh, between the physical threads. Right, and uh, so you can you cannot see it on the uh, on the on the image, but I'm going to run the uh, proof of concept right now uh, after the uh, next slide. Uh, the the data that is getting leaked is actually equal of 64 bytes. That exactly confirms that the this was the, it was the size of the um, uh, of the cache line. Um, I don't know if you can see on the on the, on the slide there. Uh, oops. Sorry. Um, so I, I couldn't find the, the screenshot with the debugger, but so you can see the patterns like 7F, F6, 7F, FF. If you would uh, compare 7F, F6 again, if you would look it up, these are actually system addresses of the kernel modules, uh, not kernel, but the, the user mode uh, modules. So these were actually, uh, you know, like return addresses or something. Um, that, that, were match, that, that are matching the, uh, you know, the, pro, the attacker process, or the, well, the victim or attacker process. You know, um, so, so, right, uh, so the next thing, okay, the school, we can do this attack, uh, it, but it's kind of really slow. So the, what, the, what the researchers did, right, uh, they tried to leak the ETC shadow during this. But how do you actually prime and make sure that, that that what we saw the uh, ETC shadow is in, is in the uh, is in the cache, right? You repeatedly relaunch the you know password uh, utility to to make sure that it's there and get that race condition between do, these two threads and try to leak the uh, uh, try to leak the the hash. Uh, so like it it is powerful, but I would say you're going to get detected. Like, if, if you're, like, in the real environment, you, like, it's going to be noticed. Like, even your system is going to notice that. Like, it's going to raise the alert, right? Um, other thing, um, in the in, in virtualized environments, uh, I don't know who does that anymore at this point, uh, but nobody offers you VPS. Well, if they do, you shouldn't be using it. Nobody offers the, the VPS that schedules... Uh, tenants on the single thread and you share the other thread with somebody else. That's basically just asking to get pwned through using this. Uh, like, um, even, even if you have a mitigations, like for KVM or uh, um, uh, Zen, when, you re when the exception happens, you're going to go, uh, in, the exception is going to be processed by the host, right? Uh, you will be able to attack the uh, actual uh, host on the server because of like IRQs and other uh, stuff that is getting processed. Um, yeah. So the POCs and the slides going to be available. Uh, I'm going to try to run this here. All right, awesome. Nope. Nope.
hard. <laughs> so I don't see it here. <laughs> All right, so we have a first process, just, uh, I made a sync, just, a sync for, just for synchronization um, to make it easier. So it should pop, come up pretty fast. Yeah, here we go. Yep. Yeah, I can see the secret string that I put in there getting licked. And yeah, like you give me the garbage, basically. Whatever is RAM, yeah. Yeah, and the rem just uh, you know stale or remnant da data that is uh, being in the in the buffer. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what do we have? All right. Um, actually, when I reported this to Intel, I said the the, the leak happens from like a, a load and store buffer, which is which was incorrect actually, because. Yeah, as I said before, I, I, I'm not, I'm a hacker, I'm not gonna read 600 pages. <laughs> it's too much, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, and uh, actually, the guys from TU Grads, uh, what they call the Meltdown UC, found it much earlier before that, but they, have, they haven't uh, shared the information uh, in, the, in the details, what, what, what was going on. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, you really want to validate the results that, that, that you are seeing, right? Um, may, you might see the CL flash, okay, it's flashing, it should be flashing, right? But it's hard to say the, if your CL flash actually flashed it or not, or maybe it was already pulled by, uh, uh, by the speculative, speculative execution engine uh, into the cache again, right? Um, because the CL flush is out of order, it's only in order for the other, all of the other CL, CL flush instructions. So I, uh, I put the, the link down below here. Uh, this guy uh, actually found this behavior, um, and there is a whole thread about it on Twitter, in January. So even before the TU grads uh, mentioned it in their pride paper, uh, that, well, he's seeing the same meltdown you see, but he was using that CL flush. And I actually haven't seen him as being mentioned on the Intel report, so I'm guessing he did not report it to Intel. Or Intel may have um, missed it in the, in the TU grads report when they reported uh, the meltdown research or other reasons. Well, yeah, you know, like after, after, the, after the, uh, this MDS came out, uh, I actually went back and looked, oh, why is it actually in the fill buffer? And then I found that I was looking in the wrong keywords, that I was looking for uh, uncacheable memory, but what actually Intel also calls it, a, a, they call it as a non-temporal store. Um, you know, uh, that, 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 that's what basically the uncacheable memory means. So they use, you know, terminology that is hard to follow sometimes. And the diagrams are, don't really make any sense sometimes. Yeah, so you don't want to jump to conclusions basically, right? Uh, and then the last one is, I would take research with a little bit salt, a uh, grain of salt, because we don't really have any tools how to check these, uh, check any of these buffers or, um, or internal structures. Even if you have, if you, even if you get the JTAG, you, the, 
it doesn't allow you to do that. Like you would need like a uh, thing what, what, what Intel calls uh, red unlock. But the, so uh, there are some details online that now available that, that provide some uh, information how the red unlock can be achieved. Uh, so uh, guys from Positive Security uh, from Moscow, uh, they, they do a lot of research on the PCH uh, and ME and, and so on. Uh, they were able to enable red unlock, which is basic a factory unlock, but there is no software available. Like, even if you have it, you don't know how to talk to the CPU because there is no information. So, and then that's it. Thank you. And as always, if you have questions, Ballot will be in the courtyard in a couple minutes.